The Publishing Ministry, Chapter 13 Evils Resulting from Centralization and Colonization Introduction In this section, the reader will find select statements dealing with five important aspects of the Church and its publishing work. Number 1. Centralization Number 2. Colonization Number 3. Confederacy Number 4. Consolidation and number five, cooperation. As far back as the middle 1870s, Mrs. White gave counsel against colonization of people and institutions resulting in consolidation and centralization of power, specifically in Battle Creek. Writing to O. A. Olson, president of the General Conference, she stated in 1896 that 20 years ago she had been shown that the publishing house on the Pacific Coast was ever to remain independent of all other institutions, that it was to be controlled by no other institution. She went on to say, Just prior to my husband's death, in 1881, the minds of some were agitated in regard to placing these institutions under one presiding power. Again, the Holy Spirit brought to my mind what had been stated to me by the Lord. I told my husband to say in answer to this proposition, that the Lord had not planned any such action. Much of the counsel against consolidation relates to the efforts to bring the publishing interests of the denomination under the control of Battle Creek. It is important to grasp this fact in the setting of the historical times. But the counsel in some cases broadens to the health and educational interests, and certain principles that have a broad application are suggested. Ellen White's definition of confederacy and consolidation, words that are often used in this discussion, follows. You know what a confederacy is, a union of men in a work that does not bear the stamp of pure, straightforward, unswerving integrity. The work committed to us by the Lord will advance rapidly only when we labor in unity. Yes, says one, this is exactly what I believe in, consolidation. But Christian unity is not what the world calls consolidation. Unity among brethren results in consolidation with Christ and with the heavenly angels. Such consolidation is heaven-born. Confederacy and consolidation in raising wages, in selfishly controlling royalty rates, in the publication of certain favored books, and in seeking control of the Pacific Press— These were among the painful steps away from the Lord and His counsel. In the Review and Herald publishing house was centered the confederacy of men who sought to dominate the publishing work in North America. The influence of this overbearing work was strongly felt in other institutions, and the results were demoralizing. Even the General Conference Association was involved in efforts to bring control of everything under the sway of Battle Creek. Ellen White wrote, Covetousness has been woven into nearly all the business transactions of the institution and has been practiced by individuals. This influence has spread like the leprosy until it has tainted and corrupted the whole. As the publishing house has become corrupted, the General Conference Association has stepped in and proposed to take the diseased child off its hands and care for it. But it is a snare for the General Conference Association to take the publishing work on its shoulders. This puts no special sanctity upon the work, but upon the General Conference Association a burden which will weigh it down, cripple it, and weaken its efficiency, unless men who have firm principle, mingled with love, shall conduct the business lines. In this step there has been a change of responsibility but the wrong principles remain unchanged. The same work that has been done in the past will be carried forward under the guise of the General Conference Association. The sacred character of this association is fast disappearing. What will then be respected as pure, holy, and undefiled? Will there be any voice that God's people can regard as a voice they can respect? There certainly is nothing now that bears the divine credentials. Sacred things are mixed and mingled with earthly business that has no connection with God. 
In 1894, the General Conference Association consisted of 21 members or trustees. The Review Board of Directors was composed of seven members. The President, Treasurer, and Auditor of the Review Board were all members of the six-member Executive Committee of the General Conference Association. Thus, there was a sort of interlocking directorate of men in Battle Creek who controlled, as far as possible, the Church and its institutions. It was against this control by a few persons that Ellen White protested. At the 1901 General Conference session, a reorganization was effected that largely corrected this type of kingly power. Ellen White was pleased with the actions taken at this important session and indicated that a victory had been gained. Cooperation between institutions and not consolidation was the goal to be kept in mind. A united effort to achieve economic and practical goals under the direction of pure, straightforward men engaged in a work with unswerving integrity would be pleasing to God and bear His stamp of approval. The Church must constantly be alert, however, to prevent a kingly type of leadership and control reasserting itself. The reins of church government must not drift into the hands of a few persons or institutions. Trustees, Ellen G. White, Estate Many interests in one locality Our people are in constant danger of centering too many interests in one locality. But it is not in the Lord's order that this should be. Again and again messages have been given concerning the dangers of such a course. In Washington and at Mountain View, our brethren should study diligently the warnings that have been given of the evil results of centering the publishing work and other interests too largely in one place. God is not pleased with the influence that results from such centralization. If all the men who gather thus in one place are wise, experienced men who walk humbly with God— then the world needs these men to stand as the Lord's representatives in many places. We are to seek the honor and glory of God in all things. We have been losing time in Washington and in Mountain View by centering so much in these places. Battle Creek Not to Swallow Up Everything The present is a time of special peril. In 1890 and 1891, there was presented to me a view of dangers that would threaten the work because of a confederacy in the Office of Publication in Battle Creek. Propositions which, to their authors, appeared very wise, would be introduced, looking to the formation of a confederacy that would make Battle Creek, like Rome, the great head of the work and enable the office of publication there to swallow up everything in the publishing line among us. This is not God's wisdom, but human wisdom. Those matters have been coming up again and again in different aspects, but this policy of consolidation would, if adopted, result in marring the work. God would have His work move firmly and solidly, but no one branch is to interfere with or absorb other branches of the same great work. Avoid Centralization of Power At times it has been urged that the interests of the cause would be furthered by a consolidation of our publishing houses, bringing them virtually under one management. But this, the Lord has shown, should not be. It is not His plan to centralize power in the hands of a few persons or to bring one institution under the control of another. Colonizing versus Plants in Different Places A Jerusalem has been made of Battle Creek, but this has not been after the Lord's direction or order. You may see some advantages in colonizing, but there are many more advantages to be obtained from making plants in different places. The work has been begun in Nashville, and it should be placed on a firm foundation that the light of the truth may shine forth from there to the regions beyond. It is God's purpose that the work shall thus be carried forward. The building you are planning to erect in Battle Creek is not necessary. To invest money in this way would set a wrong example. Our people in Battle Creek have continually been tempted to find some excuse for investing more money in building. 
Thus, other parts of the field have been robbed of buildings which they should have had. God's Call to Decentralize Enlarge ye, spread ye, yes, but not in one place only. Go out and establish centers of influence in places where nothing or next to nothing has been done. Break up your consolidated mass. Diffuse the saving beams of light into the darkened corners of the earth. A work similar to that of an eagle stirring up her nest needs to be done. The arms of power in Battle Creek are being extended more and more widely, seeking to control the work far and near, and to crush that which they cannot control. I lift my voice in protest. The spirit that now controls is not the spirit of the Lord. One publishing house in one place? I was in a room where a number were assembled in council. Brother D was presenting the idea that small local presses were not needful and were run at great expense. He said that he thought that all our bookmaking should be done by one publishing house at one place and thus save expense. There was present one of authority, and after making some inquiries, he said, These smaller printing offices can be managed in a way that will make them a help to the work of God if sufficient attention is given to them. In the past, great lack of principle has been brought into the management of our book work, and this experience will be repeated unless men's hearts are thoroughly converted, thoroughly changed. Printing of publications should be divided. The division of the General Conference into District Union Conferences was God's arrangement. In the work of the Lord in these last days, there should be no Jerusalem centers, no kingly power. The original Union Conferences developed from the six General Conference districts into which the United States and Canada had been divided at the 1889 General Conference and the two overseas districts, Europe and Australasia. In 1894, the Australasian Union Conference was formed, becoming something of a model for the reorganization of districts into unions in North America in 1901 in connection with the General Conference reorganization. The kingly power formerly exhibited in the General Conference at Battle Creek is not to be perpetuated. The publishing institutions is not to be a kingdom of itself. It is essential that the principles that govern in General Conference affairs shall be maintained in the managements of the publishing work and the sanitarium work. The Lord has declared that there should be publishing plants in various places. Supreme power should not be vested in a few large institutions. At the last General Conference, 1901, the light was given, divide the General Conference into Union Conferences. Let there be fewer responsibilities centered in one place. Let the work of printing our publications be divided. The principles that apply to the publishing work apply also to the sanitarium work. Many printing plants needed. I have words to speak to you, to the General Conference President and to the Manager of the Review and Herald. You must be guarded in your plans, for you are in danger of centralizing. If you should follow your natural dispositions, there would be a tendency to so arrange the publishing work that the majority of our books would bear the imprint of Washington. The danger of such a course compels me to speak. It is not the Lord's plan to centralize largely in any one place. The time has passed when there should be any binding about of the work and confining it to a few places. There are small printing plants to be established and recognized in the South and in other places not yet designated. The work of publication is to be developed in new lines and carried as it has never yet been carried. Confederacy in Review Offices The question has been asked, What does Sister White mean by saying and writing that there was in the office of the Review and Herald Publishing Association a confederacy that was an offense to God? If those to whom this testimony was given had been under the enlightenment of the Spirit of God, they would have understood this. There was a confederacy in regard to the matter of wages, 
Certain ones agreed together not to yield their decision on that point, and they did not until the reproof came over and over, and pressed closer and closer home, so that they dared not go farther without some change. Then they yielded but not heartily, not because they saw the sinfulness of their course of action. Did the Lord accept the spirit and the manner of the yielding? No, he could not trust them as representatives in his cause to advance his work. They had gone forward in their own spirit of self-sufficiency, and the work was marred in their hands. They confederated together to sustain and uphold one another. In what? Let them answer. I leave them with God. Sufficient is it that God would not trust his work in their hands, for them to mold and fashion after their own order, while the Holy Spirit was not molding and fashioning them. Light has been given repeatedly in regard to the spirit that should control the review and herald office. No excuse can be presented for a departure from the principles that should ever be revealed in every branch of the work of God. Men are not to put their hands to the work to fashion it after their own ideas, ignoring the principles that God has repeatedly declared should be maintained in the upbuilding and prosperity of His cause. The pattern, Jesus Christ, must ever be kept before us. The Lord Jesus says, Follow me. He that would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. This was not done, but a new order of things was introduced into the office. The counsels of God were too often ruled out of your assemblies. How? With some by an unholy confederacy. We will stand together, they said. You give me your support, and I will give you my support. This was the principle that controlled some of the workers in the office. God calls it an unholy confederacy. His grace and His Spirit had nothing to do with this human policy. Satan will leave no means untried to accomplish his object, to conceal and obscure truth and establish error. This has been done. God has been dishonored. Truth and righteousness have languished through unholy confederacy. Oh, the deceptions that Satan will practice in order to destroy the soul! Through the love of money, conscience has been sold for gain. There has been a violation of principle, of honor, of integrity. God knows every work, and it will all be brought into judgment. Oh, that the blind eyes may be opened! A Confederacy in Wrong Methods Men have tried to rob their brethren of their rights and have selfishly grasped all the available means to turn to the advantage of the Review and Herald office. They have tried to justify themselves by saying, I am doing it for the cause of God. Human preferences and prejudices have swayed the minds of those who confederated to sustain methods contrary to the Word of God. Selfishness has led those who ought to be true to principle to make crooked paths for their feet. A Confederacy in Robbing God's Treasury The course pursued in regard to wages, at the time under consideration, was a purely selfish course and was contrary to the principles on which the office was established, the principles of self-sacrifice and of justice between man and man. Those who exerted an influence to increase the wages of the workers connected with the office were displeasing God. There was a confederacy for the robbery of God's treasury. One worked to secure higher wages for others, so that the contrast between the wages of the workers might not appear disproportionate. All who acted a part to carry this influence were engaged in a selfish work which will sooner or later react upon themselves unless they repent. Evil angels exulted. And the Lord said, Shall I not judge for these things? They have turned unto me the back and not the face. Though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. But they have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name to defile it. 
the Lord brought me by His Spirit into the very meetings where you were speaking in favor of the wages of one and another being raised. Then I was shown that the result would be separation from the office because of the wrong course practiced in several lines. After I had witnessed the Confederacy for raising the wages of the workers in the office, the Lord brought me into the meetings of the auditing committee that settle with the ministers for their labor. Angels of God were there, making a record of everything done. Brother E's voice was the controlling power, cutting down wherever he pleased, deciding the wages of the workers according to his ideas and feelings. How little did anyone think that the universe of heaven were noting every transaction. Brother E was not a poor man. He accepted large wages for himself and gave his strong influence of securing large wages for others in the office. But these other workers, whose circumstances neither he nor other members of the auditing committee took pains to ascertain, were paid according to the impulse of this one man. This work will be met in that great day, when every work shall be brought into judgment, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. A Confederacy Over Royalties The publishing office was turned from its original design. Men made terms with authors. Councils were formed. Schemes were entered into. While one author was engaged in the services of a meeting at a distance, the expenses of one man were paid to go and see this brother and induce him to put the lowest figures on his books. They urged that they wished to get this important matter before as many people as possible, and that the book would have a very much larger sale if it were sold at cheap prices. The royalty was placed at the lowest figure. Then this confederacy held this example up as a rule for others— Warnings were given me that all this was the working out of a system of oppression and robbery, and that the whole institution was leavened throughout with corrupt principles, that the light of God was fast departing from all who were engaged in this confederacy. God sanctioned none of this spirit. He could not place his signature upon this devising. He would forsake these men, remove his spirit from those who entered upon this course and the glory of His presence would depart from them. The cause of God in any line is not to be advanced by such policy, for it is born of Satan and can only have His inspiration. All who do not repent and seek to set things right, God will leave to stumble on in darkness. They have not discerned unrighteousness in practice. They have secured books and diverted them from their original design to make up the sum which they wished to secure. But every page of that dark history is written in the books of heaven to react upon every soul who has engaged in these schemes, unless they shall repent with that repentance that needeth not to be repented of. The Lord cannot tolerate any such transactions as those that have been professedly done in His name. He abhors all such satanic principles. Rings of Men Encouraging Wrong Principles There will be in the office men who will lead into strange paths, those whose minds are not firmly established in the principles of present truth. These unconsecrated men will set up false waymarks and will walk in false paths because they lack clear discernment. They will manifest a burning desire to confederate, to form rings among themselves in order to sustain one another in the wrong principles they advocate. They will voice one another's words. My instructor slowly and solemnly spoke the following words. Form a confederacy, to whom they shall say, Form a confederacy, and they shall be broken in pieces. Three times were these words spoken. Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces, and give ear, all ye of far countries. Gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. 
those who connect with the office of publication should be men of sterling principle, men who will look to God daily, men who have learned thoroughly the fact that eternal vigilance is their only means of safety. If those who will be chosen to connect with the office choose to confederate with others to do the works that are now being done there, they will lose their integrity. Whoever dares to seek counsel of God and to put not his trust in the pretended purity and false piety of some of the workers now in the office will find it exceedingly difficult to maintain right principles. But the only safe course for any to pursue is to work in accordance with gospel principles and to allow nothing to swerve him from them. Enemy prompted call for consolidation. It was the enemy of our work who prompted the call for the consolidation of the publishing work under one controlling power in Battle Creek. I was told that I must lift up my voice in warning against this. We were not to be under the control of men who could not control themselves and who were not willing to be amenable to God. We were not to be guided by men who want their word to be the controlling power. The development of the desire to control has been very marked, and God sent warning after warning, forbidding confederacies and consolidation. He warned us against binding ourselves to fulfill certain agreements that would be presented by men laboring to control the movements of their brethren. Men stretching themselves beyond measure. It makes my heart ache when I think of the publishing institution. The men who have charge of the different departments are so burdened with responsibilities that they have no time to do correct work. What impression must this make upon my mind in view of the things that the Lord has revealed to me in connection with the methods and plans devised for taking up more responsibilities and your plans in reference to consolidation, taking under your guidance and control all institutions nigh and afar off? You are simply stretching yourselves beyond your measure. You have not the men who are capable of carrying such responsibilities as you have already embraced. Man's consolidation or God's theocracy. Stop where you are. You cannot retrieve your past record by seeking to reconstruct, reorganize, and consolidate other institutions with the institutions so defective in Battle Creek. I cry to you in the name of the Lord, no, no, leave the Pacific Press under God's theocracy and humble your hearts before God before it is everlastingly too late. The great day of God is coming when every man shall be known as God knows him. Consolidation tends to exalt the human. The policy of consolidation, wherever pursued, tends to the exaltation of the human in place of the divine. Those who bear responsibilities in the different institutions look to the central authority for guidance and support. As the sense of personal responsibility is weakened, they lose the highest and most precious of all human experiences, the constant dependence of the soul upon God. Not realizing their need, they fail of maintaining that constant watchfulness and prayer that constant surrender to God, which alone can enable men to hear and to obey the teaching of His Holy Spirit. Man is placed where God should be. Those who are called to act in this world as heaven's ambassadors are content to seek wisdom from erring, finite men when they might have the wisdom and strength of the unerring, infinite God. The Lord does not design that the workers in His institutions shall look to or trust in man. He desires them to be centered in him. Never should our publishing houses be so related to one another that one shall have power to dictate as to the management of another. When so great power is placed in the hands of a few persons, Satan will make determined efforts to pervert the judgment, to insinuate wrong principles of action, to bring in a wrong policy. In so doing, he can not only pervert one institution, but, through this, can gain control of others, and give a wrong mold to the work in distant parts. Thus, the influence for evil becomes widespread. Let each institution stand in its moral independence, 
carrying on its work in its own field. Let the workers in each feel that they are to do their work as in full view of God, His holy angels, and the unfallen worlds. Should one institution adopt a wrong policy, let not another institution be corrupted. Let it stand true to the principles that were expressed in its establishment, carrying forward the work in harmony with these principles. Every institution should endeavor to work in harmony with every other, just so far as this is consistent with truth and righteousness. But further than this, none are to go toward consolidating. Each house stands as independent body. Warnings have been given me that it is not wise to consolidate the Pacific Press with the Review and Herald Publishing House. Time will convince all that this matter is too serious a thing to be trifled with. The Battle Creek Publishing House is not to be the only power among Seventh-day Adventists. It must stand largely alone. The Pacific Press should not be made to fear the influence of the power invested in the publishing house at Battle Creek. The Lord has His own purpose to accomplish through these institutions. There should be no controversy on this point. There must be no more determined binding up with the interests in the publishing house at Battle Creek, so that it shall absorb the Pacific Press, making them one organ. The Pacific Press must stand by itself. The two institutions cannot better advance the work of God in consolidation, as has been contemplated. It is God's will that they stand as independent bodies. The active agencies in connection with the work at Battle Creek have placed a wrong mold upon the work. Men have devised and planned in a manner that is not after the order of God, and the publishing house in California has altogether too largely followed and adopted the methods and inventions proceeding from Battle Creek. Strength and power will be in our institutions if they keep close to the Word of God in all their connection and dealing with their fellow men. He, God, would have His institutions independent of each other, and yet in perfect harmony with each other separate and distinct entities. Again and again, at different times, and in different places, decided warnings have been given me. I could not define the import of these warnings, for they were presented to me in figures and symbols. I have been very much puzzled over this matter, which was introduced before my husband's death. Since that time, I have been shown that efforts would be made to bind up the publishing house in Oakland with the publishing house in Battle Creek, in order that the publishing house at Battle Creek might have control. These warnings I did not fully understand, because many times the message had been given me that these two institutions should not be at strife one with another, or manifest anything savoring of jealousy or envy, but that they should stand as sister institutions, each doing its appointed work as God's instrumentality. Each institution was established of God to do its respective work. Before my husband's death, this matter in regard to the publishing house at Battle Creek and the publishing house at Oakland was presented to me under the figure of the vine, and since that time it has been presented to me under the same figure. The Lord has shown me that these two institutions are to be kept as separate as two branches, which, though distinct, both center in the parent vine. They are not to be merged into one, but are to be kept distinct, yet each is to derive its nourishment from the same source. Pacific Press to Stand Independent in God God would have had the Pacific Press Publishing House stand free and clear, and untrammeled by any power. God would have every one of His institutions rise above the frosty atmosphere in which the human agent will be if left to Himself. Inclined to live and breathe, He must live and breathe in the holy, pure, life-giving atmosphere of heaven, else sentiments and plans and resolutions will clog and impede our heavenly advance movements. God has presented to me, which I have presented to you, 
that the Pacific Press should stand on its own individuality, relying upon God, doing its work in God as His instrumentality, the human agent working with God, contrite in spirit, meek and lowly in heart, ready to be taught of God, but not subject to any earthly power that shall propose plans and ways that are not after the light God has given. Be on guard. Be on guard and do not sell your religious liberty to any office or to any man or board or council of men. Pacific Press Branches Allowed to Live the Lord presented before me that branches of this work should be planted in other places and carried on under the supervision of the Pacific Press, but that if this proved a success, jealousy, evil surmisings, and covetousness would arise. At the present time, branch offices of the Pacific Press are operating in Omaha, Nebraska, Oshawa, Ontario, and Montemorelos, Mexico. Efforts should be made to change the order of things and embrace the work among other interests at Battle Creek. Men are very zealous to change the order of things, but the Lord forbids such a consolidation. Every branch should be allowed to live and do its own work. Mistakes will occur in every institution, but if the managers will learn the lesson all must learn, to move guardedly, these errors will not be repeated and God will preside over the work. Every worker in our institutions needs to make the Word of God his rule of action. Then the blessing of God will rest on him. He cannot with safety dispense with the truth of God as his guide and monitor. If man can take one breath without being dependent upon God, then he may lay aside God's pure, holy Word as guidebook. The truth must take control of the conscience and the understanding in all the work that is done. The Holy Spirit must preside over thought and word and deed. It is to direct in all temporal and spiritual actions. Pacific Press and Foreign Publications I approve of the efforts that have been made to establish our German and Scandinavian publishing work at College View. After the Review and Herald plant burned in 1902, the printing of foreign publications was moved to the College Press, College View, Nebraska, and later the work was carried on under the name International Publishing Association. This association was taken over by the Pacific Press Publishing Association in 1915, but the building it occupies was destroyed by fire in 1916 and a factory was built at Brookfield, Illinois. There the work continued until it was transferred in 1959 to the home office of the Pacific Press Publishing Association at Mountain View, California. I hope that plans will be devised for the encouragement and strengthening of this work. The whole burden of the work must not be left with our foreign brethren, nor should our brethren throughout the field leave too heavy a load on the conferences near College View. The members of these conferences should lead out and do their best, and all should come to their assistance. The truth is to be proclaimed to all nations and kindreds and tongues and peoples. Our German and Danish and Swedish brethren have no good reason for not being able to act in harmony in the publishing work. Those who believe the truth should remember that they are God's little children, that they are under His training. Let them be thankful to God for His manifold mercies and be kind to one another. They have one God and one Savior, and one Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, is to bring unity into their ranks. Individuality and Personal Responsibility I understand something about these two institutions, for my husband and I had to lead out in establishing them and carrying them forward. The Lord gave special directions as to how they should be conducted. These principles I have not withheld from those who were numbered as believers in the truth. The work has been presented to me as, at its beginning, a small, very small rivulet. The representation was given to the prophet Ezekiel of waters issuing from under the threshold of the house eastward 
at the south side of the altar. Please read Ezekiel 47. Mark verse 8. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country, and go down into the desert, and go into the sea, which, being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. This work was represented to me as extending to the east and to the north, to the islands of the sea, and to all parts of the world. As the work increases, there will be a great and living interest to be managed by human instrumentalities. The work is not to be centered in any one place, not even in Battle Creek. Human wisdom argues that it is more convenient to build up the interest where it has already obtained character and influence. Mistakes have been made in this line. Individuality and personal responsibility are thus repressed and weakened. The work is the Lord's, and the strength and efficiency are not all to be concentrated in any one place. Publishing Houses to Avoid Strife for Supremacy In bookmaking there is a striving for the supremacy. God says to every soul, Take heed. The leaven of influence is a powerful thing. Whether good or evil, it gathers all to itself. If the leaven of selfishness, covetousness, and hard-heartedness is allowed to enter, it will subdue all the properties of the body to corrupting force. There will be no bowels of mercy, no tender consideration, no fighting against objectionable traits of character, which so quickly develop into giants of evil. Unless this root of bitterness is cast out of the soul, it will continually spring up, and by it many will be defiled. The Review and Herald and the Pacific Press have been presented to me as cherishing a spirit of rivalry. The admonitions and warnings God has given them to bring about a reform are not heeded. Annoyance is felt. Disagreeable sensations are awakened when reproof comes. But the work that needs to be done to cleanse these institutions from selfishness, covetousness, and unfair dealing is not done. All the light, all the evidence that God in reproof has given you has been reasoned away by some and made to mean something that was not understood. God designs that the offices from which our publications go forth shall be living channels of light. Why do you not labor to establish every line of business upon right principles? Cooperation is God's plan. Let every department of our work, every institution connected with our cause, be conducted on considerate, generous lines. Let every branch of the work, while maintaining its own distinctive character, seek to protect, strengthen, and build up every other branch. Men of varied abilities and characteristics are employed for carrying forward the various branches of the work. This has always been the Lord's plan. Each worker must give his own branch special effort. But it is the privilege of each to study and labor for the health and welfare of the whole body of which he is a member. Not consolidation, not rivalry or criticism, but cooperation— is God's plan for His institutions. Cooperation, not merger. Let the B.C. Publishing House and the Pacific Press regard each other as sister institutions. In cooperation, they can exert a healthful influence upon each other, but not in consolidation. These institutions are not to become merged into one. The managers in Battle Creek have indulged unchristian, unbrotherly feelings, even envy and jealousy toward the Pacific Publishing House. They have had a feverish desire to belittle that institution and to bring it under their own jurisdiction. But the light that I have had for years is that these institutions must stand separate, each preserving its own individuality. A nearer relation than this will tend to the injury of both. I fear that the managers of the Pacific Press have accepted propositions without the careful and prayerful consideration which should have been given them. No proposition should be accepted, no matter from whence it may come, 
unless it is definitely stated in writing, and a copy given to the managers of each institution. Then let several of the leading men together bring the matter before the Lord, spread out the writing before Him, and with earnest prayer seek for clear discernment and sharp discrimination to decide whether the plans proposed are for the glory of God and the good of both institutions.